that you possibly can because as you come to know if you want to write and write a good thesis or even an analog kind of research paper, then in that area there is no substitute for reading a lot and looking at many, many sources. And then coming to a conclusion that in this particular area, probably I can add something of that. We are all kind of Google generation, right? There is so much online, there is nothing left. So what do you do? And at times there is so much information that you get overwhelmed. And I can think about research. Research is searching. Searching information that is relevant. Searching information and the ability to be able to do that. Information that's pertinent. Information that's accurate. Information that's reliable. And information that give you plenty of opportunity to answer the kind of questions that you want to have. So in this case, he came, we talked about it, and then we, he decided, obviously it was his judgment, I was going simply to assist him. And his judgment initially was that he would like to do work on two four, and then ultimately we decided that he was going to work on self-defense, under international law. And his name we probably have seen is Jawad Zari. He is the foreign minister of Iran. He is the one who did the nuclear deal with America and with Canada. So he and I, we worked together for about two, two and a half years, every week he would come and bring his chapter and we would talk about it, but in any way, where I began is that first of all, you've got to think about the topic that you are going to work on, read a lot, think a lot, see that you've got to passion about it. There are some areas in which you probably can do a more now. For example, one student came and here also, one of your uh, PhD students came yesterday and uh, we were talking about the possibility and he had uh, four or five areas that he is passionate about. And I thought, think about one that we really want to have. And one of the areas that he had and one of my students just recently, last uh, semester I was teaching, and an uh, LLM student, not a PhD one. And uh, he had done good work writing some very good research papers and he wanted to do his final research paper by LLM. And we talked about it and he said, you know, I'm very much interested in customary international law. And I said, you've done a whole lot of reading? <coughs> and he said, yes. And I said, is there anything after you have read that you can add to it? And it's very little that you can because just for international law, people who are giants in the field have written about it. It's practically exhausted. So unless you can add value to it, it's not going to be all totally original. There's very little. But what you can do is, you can add your own personality, your own perspective, and that is what you can do. And there's always some gap, some ambiguities, some things that are not really very well, clearly articulated, and you can add to it. So in research, to start up doing research, you have to decide a topic. Now, Jawazari, his dissertation 
was exemplary. He had done wonderful work. After doing his PhD, he went back. As you know that he started with the foreign service, he also started teaching. And he has been visiting professor at the university in Tehran. But then he became the ambassador to the United Nations. And at that time, I simply wanted to know him, but the teachers, please know that your students, they can become lifelong friends. And so he invited me to come and address the United Nations. And that's the only time that I have addressed the United Nations when he became the ambassador. And afterwards, as he has come to the United States, unfortunately, relations between Iran and the U.S. have not been very good. And the United States, which I totally reject, has uh, put some kind of constraints upon those people from Iran, especially diplomats, that they cannot travel outside New York. So he can't come to Denver. But we have been in touch. Uh, so I started by saying, because we're talking about doing research, that doing research means you are the one, for example, if you are practicing law and you have got a question, then it's a very simple one that you want to answer to that question. Research is the one that will give you the answer. And then you want to see again that you've got relevant information, pertinent information, information that's accurate, information that is authoritative, that you can rely upon, that has got total reliability. And once you have that information, then you have to see how to manage it, how to systematically deal with it and how to present it in a very coherent kind of fashion. And then the issue comes up that there is overwhelming information. How do I take the pertinent information and that will give the scope? What is the scope of my input? For example, a student came this time again in LLM. Um, just a couple of months ago, three months ago, and wanted to work on death penalty. And I said, what do you want to do about death penalty? Are you going to do quantitative research? Are you going to collect data? Are you going to talk with people who at the present time are practicing in the field and doing death penalty punishment cases? Or we want to do a drug crime Or we want to do case study. We want to do comparative study. And I have to pick up all possibilities and have you spend a couple of weeks because you want to look at all kinds of sources before you decide what area you want to do. You want to look at sources. You want to look what's pertinent what's relevant to you once you have decided upon a topic and then you begin. And then again, these are the things. Information that's accurate, information that's authoritative, information that's pertinent. And the scope of your own inquiry that will tell you what to do. And here, one request that I have for you is that think about it and think about where to start. Because of uh, writing my own work, I have never started writing until I have had almost everything that has been written to me. I also am a columnist. I do a column for a newspaper. And that newspaper is kind of uh, in the United States. There are about 10 call papers that are pretty good. Two or three are the only ones that are kind of national papers. It's New York Times, it's Wall Street Journal. And once you go beyond that, 
then I think there are some leisure papers, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, and in that kind of category comes my Denver Post. And on Denver Post, I do a piece, and I think if you put denverpost.com and simply put my name, then those uh, columns would come. <coughs> and those columns, they are not a lot of your articles. They are not chapters. It's a very small, they give me only 650 to 700 words. And I have to write those 650 to 700 words in a way to do two things. One, as a person with A class or even high school education can read it, can understand it, so it has to be very simple. Second, I have to see that a person who knows about that area of more law, that after reading it, he or she is going to say, yes, it added something to me, even if it is put in a very, very simple fashion. So I think you have to then decide, for example, this is not a column, you don't need to worry about it, but if you are writing a PhD dissertation, or if you are doing LLM, or if you are uh, in LLB, I think you can write papers. But how coherent is it? How clear it is? How well have you articulated it? And that is the kind of setting in which I would begin doing research. Um, I think I should probably stop here initially and have you tell me you don't simply have to ask questions, but tell me what you do in your own research, those who are doing, anyone who is doing quantitative research, looking at empirical studies, gathering data, interviewing people, because in all that, there is another thing that you have got to keep in mind, and that is the ethical part. That you are doing research, you are doing work, and you have to keep in mind that it has got to reach out to people, but it has to have some standards set. And a person who is going to read it should enjoy reading it, should get something out of it, but also should say that it was done in a very ethical fashion, it is well done in a way that adds value to it and in an ethical way. So I'm going to stop here for the time being. I'll add some more things. I can give some more examples. Um, let me give one more example. And again, this is a person uh, whose name you might have seen. She was my student. And she became the secretary of state, Condoleezza Rice. And she was secretary of state under Clinton, under Clinton, under Bush. And for many, many years, and I think at one time she really had a great deal of impact upon, upon the, in the international arena. Now when she became Secretary of State, and I think I need to simply mention it to you for my colleagues who are faculty members, that uh, you have many students, they come and go, and uh, those students, many of them probably are with you lifelong in terms of friends and they need some help, they will always call upon you, ask you. Now she became Secretary of State and the first part, part the research part, she took two classes with me, one when she was undergraduate and then it was her uh, last year of undergraduate and she took a class in the in, in international law. Then she went to work from the University of Denver to Notre Dame to do her master's. After master's, she came back for PhD to the University of Denver and she took the second class. But I remember at that time she was not doing research, but in a different kind of setting. 
she wanted to know what area in PSD she should focus on. And obviously that would be a research topic also. But she and I did not work on research. But she did see my advice as to what area she should be working on. And we talked about her interests, we talked about her language, we talked about her travels, <coughs> what she had done, what she was interested in. And then we decided, she decided, I just simply assisted her, helped her. But then she decided that she wanted to focus on Russia. At that time, Soviet Union. And we had at the Graduate School of International Studies a dean, name is Joseph Corbell. Corbell doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't matter. But uh, he was an um, um, expert on Russia. He was uh, from Eastern Europe. He had left Eastern Europe, but he had followed Russia. Soviet Union and had done a lot of writing in it. So she became an expert on the Soviet Union. Did her dissertation on Soviet Union. But again we had to search, decide as to what area, what topic that she wanted to do. So that was simply one more thing that I wanted to mention to you before you either make comments or ask questions. So I'm open for you. Anything, any questions. But I have said anything, if it uh, makes sense to you, any question on it, and also any comment that you want to make about your own research, what you are doing, how it's going, where you are, and um, are you getting data, are you looking at the um, areas that you want to do, are you doing the school, have you done a pretty extensive outline, have you started writing some chapters? Uh, because um, I think it's always good that have very comprehensive kind of outline as to where you are going, how it's going to get you there, and starting in the introductory part, what you are going to study and what you are going to do. Because what I'm saying to you, uh, nothing novel, nothing really <coughs> Complicated, it's very simple, it's elementary. All of you have done it. I'm simply putting it in concrete terms for you. So, any question, any comment about doing research? So, I want yeah. to. Uh, it's okay, sir. Very good afternoon, sir. My name is Arvind Kumar. My question is: uh, Today uh, we have moved away from, you know, from uh, legal research. In fact, so in this era of globalization, since yesterday we talked about private international law. Uh, what is your take about transnational legal research and how university and academia all across the globe should collaborate in furtherance for the transnational legal research? Very good. Thank you, sir. I think that today when you talk about legal research. It's not simply law. You have to look at social sciences. You have to look at policy. And so I would say that uh, as you look at your sources, and um, I should have mentioned that and I didn't, but you cannot get away from simply doing doctrinal search in law. If you want to do an area that has got some bearing upon society, then you've got to do social sciences. Some things you might have even philosophical setting. You might have some historical setting. And so I think uh, research has to be comprehensive. When I talk about the school, I should have mentioned all that and thank you for saying it. Uh, cannot be purely. And then sometimes, you know, for example, you're practicing, you've got an issue pertaining to jurisdiction. You've got an issue pertaining to matrimonial. Obviously, it is simply that, and you might have some societal uh, issue in it, and you might do that. But otherwise, for a client, um, you are doing the legal research, and it's going to be legal enough. But as a scholar, when you do want to have an impact on society for what you do and what you study and what you write, 
you cannot simply do alone that kind of legal research. You have got to go beyond that. And that's why when I said sources, varied sources, authoritative sources, reliable sources, accurate sources. And that means that you have to have critical thinking. Critical thinking in order to see what out of all that as part of that Google generation and to have overwhelming information on the tip of our hands. You know what we can do is click a button, click a mouse, touch a button. All that information flows into and you can be overwhelmed. And there's plenty of it. And you don't know what is good, what's not. And that is where you need to be able to use your own judgment and decide what is accurate, what's authoritative, what's pertinent, what is good for your scope, and that is what needs to be done. So thank you for asking that. All right, anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such a particular day. Uh, there are many PhD students seated here, and we have a uh, Yeah. And many of them. Yeah. Many of them are the winner. Oh, yeah. What winner for PhD? <laughs> yes. Wait, you should come and sit here. I should sit here. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, sir. Uh, actually, many of them are doing research on comparative law of different nations and law being connected to societies and societies that have most different settings. Would you please, uh, you know? Throw some light on how they should approach when you do a comparative study of the laws. What are the key things that should be made Very good. Uh, in comparative setting, because I have uh, taught comparative law, uh, do, do some more comparative in uh, the American Journal of Comparative Law. I'm one of the editors also, American Society of Comparative Law. Um, I'm on their board of directors. Um, and uh, when you go into the academy, comparative law, I'm a member of it. Um, but comparative law study, um, again, I want to give you an example. Um, an example is in the same kind of setting, but this is a student from Saudi Arabia. And uh, he came and wanted to do work on death penalty. Um, because students can work on the same issue, many of them, some of them, but this one wanted to work on death penalty. And I asked him, and then we wanted to talk about the scope of his study. And he wanted to, to do comparative. So then we thought about what would be the best to do in comparative. He could take Saudi Arabia, he knows about it. And I thought he is in the United States, and the United States is such a complex kind of setting. On death penalty, it would be wonderful for him to look at the United States. And then we thought about it, that he is talking about a country, Saudi Arabia, with death penalty, is there all the time, America, where many states have totally abolished it, others are doing it, there is Texas, there's Oklahoma, there are many states where death penalty is very, very common. So that is the other thing. And then we thought we should also take a country or a region where death penalty is totally abolished. And we looked at it and we thought that maybe the best thing is to take the European Union. Not a country, but a region. And then do comparative study. But then it became totally, totally, you know, unmanageable. The entire European Union, United States, Saudi Arabia. And then we decided that we could do just simply a couple parts of all of that and we decided to narrow it. Because in doing research also, you've got to narrow it. In comparative areas, sometimes, and then here, you know, you've done research, you have to decide on how you want to do it. My suggestion to most of my students has been that initially do begin with secondary sources. Secondary sources are books, secondary sources are journals, 
secondary sources of chapters, secondary sources of encyclopedia. Start with that. In my own country, in the U.S., own country, I came from here, I consider this my own country. But in the U.S., you've got Lexus, you've got Westlaw, you've got Hein Online. So I want them to start with that. Look into one or two or four or five good articles in the same kind of area, not necessarily exactly what you are doing, but related ones. And in them, there will be many authorities in their footnotes. Go check them out, see what is pertinent for you. And then those who want to really do some more work, not to simply rely upon second resources. But if you've got something on the United Nations, go to the primary source, go to the UN website. You've got a treaty, look it up. Primary sources are important for your PhD. Not to simply rely upon the secondary sources, but to begin with them. And then if you're doing comparative law, then I think of you might want to know that the place where you have, do you have other languages? I'm not suggesting that you must have, but it's always helpful. For example, if you're going to be doing some work in Saudi Arabia, do you know Arabic? You're going to do something with Germany, with France, do you know German, do you know French? Or you can find from that country's literature in English. So reviewing the literature, reviewing what has been done before, is absolutely important because you don't want to simply regurgitate all that. You want to add some value. I'm sorry, I... Does that answer? Yeah. So, because uh, last time you had share with us how to go about to do a virus study. So I know that Thank you. they can have a person. Thank you. Any other question or comment? Sir, I am doing my coursework and I am thinking to write my research paper on a topic legality of preemptive strike under the Charter of United Nations. Can it be developed as a customary international law? Sir, we have seen that we are living in an era of nuclear weapon and mass destruction weapon. We cannot wait that if we have a substantive information that we may face the attack of WMD or nuclear weapon. We cannot wait that attacks should happen, then we will take action. So we are living in such kind of era and we don't have a right to anti Dependent self defense under the Charter of United Nations. Yes, we have seen that uh, there was misuse of preemptive strike by USA against Iran. They have falsely claimed that they, are, they were having mass extension weapon. But can we develop is it, uh, is it as a customary international law, like preemptive strike? We cannot automatically reject this notion that we cannot have or any country cannot have the right to preemptive strike. Right. So the question is being put here, can it become customary international law? And as many of you who have done international law, you know that in order to become a custom from a usage, you have to have state practice, you have to have opinion views. So if you are going to look at it, then it depends. The scope is vast. You can look at not all the countries, but you can look at some major countries. And that countries would be starting with the US, China, Russia, you might look at India, but you have to select a few countries, and countries that are developed countries, some that are developing countries, you have to take probably countries from regions, that would be Africa, that would be Asia, that would be Latin America, and see what kind of happy present time state practice is. 
on that preemptive, you can see that diplomatic, that uh, more than diplomatic, their own national kind of parliaments, legislatures, when they have looked at the United States action in Iraq, what have they said? And then so there is a lot of work that we have to do in order to see if at the present time there is an evolution, even if it's not there at the present time, even if it's not totally uniform, that at least that practice is preponderant practice by countries. And countries, not simply developing countries, but among these developed countries. And then you've got to come to a conclusion, is it evolving? Is it even that trend? But then obviously, you know, you have to do a whole lot of reading, no substitute for that, and a whole lot of work on it. And I think when I talk about ethics, I did not spell it out, but the point here is that you have to have integrity, you have to have honesty, and all those qualities that are human qualities that give you an indication that what you are saying resonates with people saying that this is ethical, this is honest, this is totally with integrity that the person has done, and that is absolutely, absolutely essential. You know, that word I did not want to even go there, plagiarism, or doing things that um, are not uh, ethical. Um, I simply used the word and left it at that, but uh, spell it out. I think I um, feel that um, um, in this intelligent group of people that is understood, that is uh, just a um, very acceptable and um, not to even talk about it, but to see that that is part of life. But maybe I should even mention that integrity, honesty, ethical considerations that are absolutely, absolutely essential, no compromise. Can you offer anybody? He said there are two people. All right, please. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Chukri Gogoi. So we just heard you say that uh, empirical research is very important. But what we see in India is very less of good empirical research, at least in the field of law. So sir, if you would guide us on how to proceed with a proper empirical research. Very good. Um, you know, the sad part is that I am not an expert on empirical research. Recently, I, uh, I usually have my Sometime, uh, my research assistant or students, and I want to give them the opportunity to have their name. And I might have done 90% of the work, and have the student done 10%, and I still would put his or her name on it, so that uh, that person in his or her own career might be able to take some advantage. Um, this is where I talk about ethical, talk about all that. Uh, and I know that in some instances, and especially in sciences, student who is your research assistant has done all the work, and you put your name on it. In social sciences, in law, it doesn't happen, but still I think uh, you need to keep that at the back of your mind. So the point that I was going to make for you is that recently we did work and I wanted to look at uh, um, women's rights and um, all that. Um, many of you probably know that there are now Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. How many of you know about them? Raise your hand. Sustainable Development Goals up to 2030. And um, before that there was LDGs that ended in 2015. Raise your hand, so who knew about them. All right. Um, but uh, the point I wanted to make for you is that we wanted to look at that because 
The goal today is that by 2030, there should be absolutely no discrimination. That women should have total equality. And we want you to see where we are today. Now I could go back 12 years. I could go back to what the countries have done. I could go back to all these women's organizations and their studies and their work. And that is quality. But there was a student of mine who had done her master's in statistics and she was very, very good in doing empirical research and doing all that. And I'm not an expert on it. So I wanted her to work on it. She did all that analysis of very different settings. What works, what doesn't work. Does legislature work? Legislation work? Does enforcement work? Does simply <coughs> the Prime Minister, the President putting a great deal of focus on it work? So she did a whole lot of that quantitative research. And doing that statistically. So those of you who want to do empirical research, you have to have that kind of, not simply bent of mind, but that kind of expertise to be able to understand, to be able to do all that statistical models and to work with them. So I'm sorry, I probably can't really help you very much, but um, you have to have that uh, expertise in order to do good statistical research. Good afternoon. My name is Amitri. So we know that technology today's uh, one of the advancements are helping research in every field, including medical, engineering, and whatnot, uh, through high performance computing, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and so on. Uh, how, is, how do you see uh, technology affecting and uh, helping in legal research? And uh, what further improvements you would like to see in this area? I think both, and you know probably better than I do in this area, because uh, I uh, am a novice still in this technological field. What had happened was that about 15 years, I was um, an approved vice chancellor in my university, in charge of all international activities. And uh, I also taught at the Graduate School of International Studies and at the law school. And so I had uh, in all three places um, assistants, and these are students who grew up at this age starting on computers. So they looked at me and they didn't say in so many words, but their message was clear to me. To say to me, they didn't say it. And they said, you idiot. You'll take 10 times more then I will, in order to get what you want done. So they never let me <coughs> do anything on these statistical, technological things. And so I remain illiterate. I know a little about them, I follow them, but I think of technology, uh, in intelligence, this uh, I, um, I think the point simply is that they are both. both. Uh, distraction at times, but they are opportunity. And I think at this stage, it will be at our, on our own peril that we ignore them. So I think we need to take advantage of it fully. Uh, in law schools in the United States, technology now is playing a very, 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 very heavy part. And I think all of you, um, and especially in this country, where people are savvy, and uh, as you think about uh, this country, it always says that we are the best on computers, best in technology. So I think uh, the future is yours. And I know that uh, you'll be able to do that, but I really 
can't really give you more than that, both an opportunity and a challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to take just one or two more questions because um, uh, Ahuja Ji <coughs> had told me to talk about lecturing and I haven't touched upon it. Yes, yes. So I, I think we spent the entire time on research. <coughs> Let us just take one more question and then at least I can say five or ten minutes, five minutes <coughs> on lecturing. I, I thought I would take half an hour on each. But uh, say la vie. Yes, sir. Good yes, ma'am. I'm curious to know that when students who are your uh, mentee, who are very passionate about their topic, when they come to you and say that, sir, we're not able to discipline ourselves and procrastination is getting in the way, how do you deal with that as a mentor? Because I feel a lot of PhD students are very passionate, but they're not able to discipline themselves to get down to writing and reading. Very good. Um, I think you're absolutely right because um, as a good lawyers, as good uh, academicians in the law, um, that is our bread and butter, writing and writing well. Because both be speaking and writing. And in writing, I think I would have to say two things to you. One is that kindly see that um, just the basic elementary things, grammar, punctuation, how clearly you write, how articulate you are, I think those are very, very important things. And read it again, over and over again, so that you can take care of any lack of proper, understandable, clear explanation, you should, you should make sure that uh, the writing is well. I think I can't overestimate, um, underestimate either way, but I can't really tell you how important it is um, that writing should be clear and writing should be um, without any of those flaws and blemishes. Um, let's take a couple minutes on, um, on uh, lecturing. And uh, lecture, I will use the term lecture because that is what uh, Dr. Ruja wanted me to talk about. Um, all of you who are going to be in the academy, and especially my colleagues, they at times have to lecture. Because lecturing is imparting information. In the United States, obviously there are different ways that people teach. I do not lecture. I um, um, know what I'm going to do. And uh, you know, what do you call it, Socratic method or whatever you want to call. Um, I would probably set the tone. And then I would have students in conversation and uh, the hope is and sometimes I don't totally succeed but the hope is that by the time the class ends all that I could have given them by lecture every part of it I have given to them they have understood it but they have done it by interaction with me I have asked questions I have used the hypotheticals, I have quizzed them, they have quizzed me, and it's through that conversation that I can convey to them all that I want to convey by the lecture. But leave that part. Lecture still becomes important. And what you see in a lecture? Four or five things have come to my mind. One, not to make it dull. Second, not to try to put all those 150 things that you want to 
scam in a lecture, so it becomes very dense. Important items 3, 4, 5, not more than that. See how you want to cover them in a very methodical, in a very systematic, in a very comprehensive fashion, but at the same time with clear articulation. Very, at times I don't vary and I should, but very module your own presentation. What's most important is look over. You sitting here, standing here, you can see what's happening. How engaged they are. How interested they are. Even during the lecture, I can stop, I can quiz, I can have them involved with it, engaged with me, even in a lecture. Because patience is not inexhaustible. And usually after 10-15 minutes, eyes glaze over. And especially if you are teaching, which I teach at one time, 1.15, it's just after lunch. Here people eat lunch later, but there people eat lunch about 12. So after lunch, the time is for siesta. And I teach human rights. <laughs> human rights to rest. Human rights to take a nap. So I've got to see that on 115, not a single one is inattentive. I don't have a chalk in my hand that I can throw at them. <laughs> what I tell them, I said, I can yell at you. Even from a distance, I can see you. And so I think the point simply is, you don't have to be an entertainer. You don't have to be a comic. You don't have to tell all the time stories, especially war stories. But what you need to do is engage them. See that they are, you know, it's not you, it's they. In the United States, as you probably know, I as a teacher, I teach, I write the exam, I grade the exam, I don't have any teaching assistance that's not done. You are the one responsible for everything. And as I grade exams, and if my students have not done well, it's not their fault, it's my fault. How well have I communicated? My job is not simply to give a lecture. My job in giving a lecture is how much have they learned. And I have to assess it. And I have to find it out from them. And that's part of my lecture. Then maybe next day, I'll begin with them, twist them, see what they have learned after what I said. And if I have not communicated well, it's my fault, not theirs. So I think uh, to my own faculty members and my colleagues, I've got to say two things. One, be good to your students. They'll be good to you. It's my student, one of them, who put a million dollars in my name, and in three to six months, students from all over the world, without asking anything, somebody sent a note to one of these students, and another million dollars came in. Another million dollars have come in from students, and it's not the university, it's not the law school, it's not the faculty that created the Vedanta Center for International Law. It's my students who did it. And other students, on their own, not talking with me, not asking me, and I did not know that, did not know that. They started on their own, and they have now about a million and a half dollars, and they have a professorship in my name. What else can you ask? 
usually you die or you retire and then the faculty or the university or law school they might have a chair in your name a professorship in your name but in my case it's not in memoriam i'm still kicking <laughs> and intend to do for many more years two years ago students gave me the most outstanding faculty award and the mentorship award and these are students you know as i mentioned to you they are lifelong friends and in class and outside the class we laugh we have wonderful time but those students they are secure enough and they are at the present at the same time have that kind of stature and understanding they know when to keep the distance and when not and that friendship blossoms and at the same time they know that i am a teacher i don't need to say that they are much more respectful than i want them to be. so goodbye thank you
and do case count, if nothing else. Do a book review. Because once you start writing, you'll enjoy it. It's a challenge. It takes time. But begin it. And your own faculty can help you. But write a case comment, even if you don't publish it, do that. Write a book review, show it to them, and learn how to do that. Because it's a craft. And it takes time. They're not the geniuses that are born. There are very few. You and I are the ones, mortals, who have got to work and work hard. Because without hard work, nothing comes. So my very, very best to you. And look forward to seeing some of you tomorrow. And any one of you who wants to go, come and learn skiing. I teach skiing, I don't teach love. Come to see me. Bye. Thank you, sir.